Army presents The Big Picture. An official report produced for the armed forces and the American people. that Sunday punch, the knockout wallop every fighter tries to develop. With it, he hopes to clinch victory. A valuable purse, a championship title may be at stake. Your United States Army has its knockout punch, too. For its mission is the defense of our nation. And the stakes are greater, much greater. Our way of life, perhaps our lands, even our lives. That's why your army carries on unceasing research and development programs. They are our guarantee that America's fighting men will continue to have winning firepower to be delivered whenever and wherever it may be needed in today's ultra-modern world. Sunday Punch, the United States Army's modern firepower. A far cry from the boxer's punch, and yet there is a link between the two. It is a link that stretches back across the centuries. Back to that cave dweller who discovered that the power of the clenched fist, his first weapon, could be transmitted through rock and club, made more punishing through pointed tip and cutting edge. The story of David and Goliath has inspired countless artists to illustrate the later discovery that animal sinew could be used to extend the range and power of the punishing blow. The sling was to be a big step toward firepower. Early devices such as catapult and ballista improved on the idea, hurling rocks greater distances against fortified strongholds. It was during the savage Thirty Years' War that the sword and spear began their exit. New weapons were taking stage. First had come the crossbow, which in turn was outmoded when Europe's map and history were reshaped by the formidable English longbow. But now, early experiments with gunpowder were ushering in the beginnings of modern artillery. Once tamed, it would be applied to small arms. This, in turn, inspired new inventiveness. Those early pieces required special ammunition. Soon, both small arms and cannon would hurl metal projectiles. By the time our own country emerged, artillery had come of age, capable of achieving range, accuracy, and destructive power, the clenched fist had come a long way. Cannons used lead balls loaded at the muzzle and had to be swabbed after firing. Leftover powder grains might ignite and blow up gun and crew. Napoleon Bonaparte would soon employ cannon against personnel as well as against fortified positions. Firepower would make him dictator of Europe. Our own Civil War brought full realization of artillery's versatile uses. Superior firepower helped write the end of that tragic chapter.
cannon and small arms both were still loaded at the muzzle, but early efforts toward rapid and continuous fire had made their appearance, and so too, experimental breech loaders. War with Spain brought national awareness of the Army's efforts to give its fighting men the ultimate in firepower. The muzzle loader had disappeared to join catapult and longbow. Modern breech loading arms were now extending our own clenched fist. Then in 1917 came our country's first test in worldwide conflict. The older weapons, greatly improved, were there for our armies, among them new, heavier tools of war. But something unforeseen was happening. Although the truck replaced the horse, range and power were costing mobility. The enemy, too, was finding that while he could hurl shells distances never before dreamed of, the giant cannon mounted on flat cars must be restricted to the rails that carried it. And while conventional artillery was accounting for 70% of battle casualties, two new sources of firepower enter the scene. The first of these came about through man's successful efforts to achieve flight. As early as 1909, the Army had bought its first plane. Soon, there was an Army Air Service under direction of the Chief Signal Officer. Reconnaissance and observation were the airplane's only roles, but soon it became apparent that it could act as a flying platform to carry firepower directly to the enemy. In short, it gave artillery new mobility, flexibility, and range. The other innovation that was to reshape the techniques of war was the tank. This mobile armored juggernaut could carry its fire directly to the enemy where his small arms would be ineffectual, then move out of range of retaliatory weapons. That new extension of the clenched fist had its origins in antiquity. Domestication of the horse and invention of the wheel had inspired its possibilities. Ancient Assyria had gained its brief ascendancy through the terrifying striking force of the first chariots. Centuries later, elephants would give Hannibal the Great the same combination of striking power, armor, mobility, and demoralizing effect. By the Middle Ages, individual fighting men were embracing the same principles. Good for laughs at this late date, a print of the period shows an inventive attempt to utilize them along with multiple weapons. Now, in World War I, the goal was reached. With the two new weapons, the ultimate in firepower had been achieved. Men said that war had outlawed itself. There would be no more wars. But war did come. And once again, it came to us. ordnance and a vast complex of industry were soon turning out the weapons to give the nation winning punch. This time that firepower must operate in a worldwide range of terrains and climates opposed by varied tactics. There would be alternately sunbaked or frozen flint-hard deserts of North Africa.
would be steamy, jungle-matted battle areas in the east, testing both weapons and the men they served. Western Europe with warfare in towns, open plains, and wooded country. The tank was there, the weapon men had said would outlaw war. That other weapon was there too the flying platform that could carry artillery fire. Its capabilities were well epitomized in the Army Air Corps' weapon, the Flying Fortress. Other Army planes, too, were mounting weapons in the struggle. extensions of the clenched fist were in the making, the first foreshadowed by the use of rockets. Back in the 13th century, the Chinese had used flaming arrows, as they called them, to repel Mongol invaders. Undoubtedly, they discovered a relationship between the length and speed of flight and the heat generated by their primitive rockets. Highly incendiary, their use became restricted to inflammable targets. A brief popularity in the Western world dwindled as conventional artillery proved its superior capabilities for precision fire. Nevertheless, rocketry was never entirely discarded, and in our War of 1812, it was effectively employed by British troops. During a night attack on Fort McHenry, a young civilian was impressed by the rocket's red glare. Francis Scott Key would later incorporate the phrase in his poem which became our national anthem. Within the British Army, rockets continued to be promoted by a small group of enthusiasts. Fuels that burned longer and generated more heat were developed. Accuracy and control of flight remained unsolved problems, but nevertheless the rocket stepchild of artillery lingered on. Out of the annals of our war with Mexico in 1846, there is record of our own limited use of rockets. It remained, however, for our own century to solve the basic problems of rocket guidance. Credit for the breakthrough rests with an American, Dr. Robert H. Goddard. Dr. Goddard's theories, as well as experimental models, were intended primarily for physical research. Nevertheless, he foresaw the military possibilities and during World War I, had engaged in an army project for their development. Here, the artist reproduces one of Dr. Goddard's early models. The war's end diminished interest, but the physicist continued his work. His basic principles and formula molded the future. Between the two wars, the growing Nazi war machine took up rocket missilery in earnest. Despite early failures, the work went on. At a later date, with success theirs, German scientists frankly acknowledge their indebtedness to the pioneering of Dr. Goddard. In 1944, the new clenched fist struck. Down from the skies over England, it smashed. First, the crude Doodlebug, the V-1, 
then a perfected rocket with self-contained propellant and built-in guidance system. Bringing unprecedented death and destruction, the V-2 came perilously close to changing the outcome of the war. Fortunately for the Allied cause, the enemy bid for victory came too late. With Allied penetration deep into Nazi territory, opposition crumbled. Rocket bases were overrun. The end was in sight. The end came as Nazi surrender rang down the curtain of war in Europe. War in the Pacific would continue until our country unloosed its own Sunday punch. We had cracked the secret of nuclear fission and our big fist grew even bigger. Within months, the Japanese surrender brought an end to hostilities in the East. The war was over. Looking back upon the two new weapons unleashed during the conflict, men now returned to the ways of peace. We're again saying that the ultimate in artillery fire had been reached, and a future war was unthinkable. Fortunately for us, the leadership entrusted with our nation's defense may not permit itself such speculation. Within five short years of the war's end, Americans were again called upon to serve overseas. The Korean action, savage however limited, did not call for our newest sources of firepower, but Army vigilance and initiative supplied its men with the proven weapons brought to a point of effectiveness never before attained. There had evolved by now a new kind of fighting man. Technical skills had become professional musts. Courage and muscle alone were not enough. modern tools of war and the modern soldier to handle them. The bigger, tougher fist was still ours. As a thematical and resourceful enemy discovered. The Korean conflict had ended. Behind our proud record of winning punch stand the Army's programs for research and development. From drafting board to field test come better and more effective weapons in endless procession, ready to maintain our defenses against any threat. Even before the end of World War II, the Army, utilizing captured V-bombs, had initiated its rocket missile reprograms. With modification of earlier systems and application of new approaches, those programs began to turn out the first of a family of missiles. Elsewhere in the world, other nations had embarked upon their own plans for this new artillery, nations whose interests conflict with our own.
Into our planning, under the inspiring leadership of men like General J.B. Medeiros, went the experience of Dr. Werner von Braun and others of the German scientists who had perfected the original V-bomb. And into the separate teams that worked on the programs went the skills and talents of our own best minds. Scientists embracing a limitless roster of fields contributed to the staggering complex of component parts that went into each of our missile family. Behind the men and women responsible for that research and planning, the Army marshaled an imposing segment of American industry to make its contribution. It was a segment that comprised every conceivable type of manufacture, from the small shop turning out a single tiny element to the mammoth of heavy industry fabricating giant missile housings. Out of those efforts emerged the giant of our missile family, a mighty first generation member. It was named for its Redstone Arsenal home site. The 70-foot monster travels at supersonic speed for a range of 200 miles and can carry an atomic warhead if required. With a built-in guidance system, Redstone can follow a preset course to strike its target. But such are the continuing programs of Army research and development that the Redstone is destined for retirement. It will be replaced by the Pershing. Pershing will be smaller and more easily handled, yet give us a harder hitting, more accurate fist. At the other end of the family in size was the Dart. This five-foot midget was planned for use with infantry and designed for pinpoint accuracy, an accuracy it achieved without doubt. Yet its more modern replacement, the more flexible, equally powerful SS-10 can offer superior performance. A pioneer among the light heavyweights of that first generation was the Corporal. Operational, it is now in the hands of units overseas. Corporal carries an atomic warhead and can engage targets at ranges as great as 75 miles. The Corporal gives a field army commander the artillery he needs for close-in firepower on the battlefield, yet offers troop support and can destroy targets deep in enemy rear areas. Here, too, in keeping with Army programs, an old-timer must give over to a younger member of the family. Improvements which make the newcomer superior to the corporal may account for its name, Sergeant. While many of its characteristics are still guarded secrets, it may nevertheless be noted that this second-generation missile improves on corporal's range, power, and reliability. Versatility marks the performance of Honest John, another pioneer now bowing out of the service. Honest John travels on its own transporter launcher, making it highly mobile and enabling it to move from one point to another to avoid counterfire. Normal artillery crew training with standard fire control techniques simplify its operation. Follow the countdown and watch Honest John take off. This time, there's atomic violence in that fist.
Little John is the improved, smaller brother that takes over upon Honest John's retirement. And La Crosse, yet another in the ever-growing family of our modern artillery. Handling these tools of war calls for a new kind of soldier. The classroom for him is inseparable from the field as a source of training. So too, the shop. Today's soldier must master a range of subjects and a variety of skills unknown to a previous generation of fighting men. For here is our modern fist, our modern striking power. that wields it. With today's artillery, we have extended the fist distances never before believed possible, given it a striking force that staggers the imagination, an accuracy heretofore inconceivable. And is this the ultimate? At each step along the way between cave dweller and present day man, people believe the ultimate had been reached. For the United States Army, only one answer is possible. Its programs will continue to improve today's firepower, and anticipate tomorrow's. Only in that way can it fulfill its mission, the defense of the nation. Only in that way can it assure itself that whenever and wherever the need arises, our bigger, stronger fist can strike to win. The big picture is an official report for the armed forces and the American people. Produced by the Army Pictorial Center. Presented by the Department of the Army in cooperation with this station.